We know a great deal about life of the past, a whole lot more than we should, considering how fragmented, shifted, and cracked the fossil record is. With what we know, we know we're getting a lot of things correct. There are ways to validate and confirm certain aspects of biology of past organisms. However, there are some aspects that are known unknowns, or even unknown unknowns. Stuff we know we don't know versus stuff we don't even know we don't know. What if everything we know about life of the past and how that life looked and acted is part of that unknown category? Let's take a trip through the pages of a book that asks that very question. At this point, you should all be aware of All Tomorrows, a billion-year chronicle of the myriad species and mixed fortunes of man. This tome was written and illustrated by the eclectic mind of a one C.M. Kozman, a Turkish researcher, artist, photographer, and author with years of experience in the realm of speculative evolution, speculative fiction, paleontology, and natural history. His book All Tomorrows was published in 2006 and took a speculative lens to the evolution of humanity. Over the next billion years, after contact with biology and physics-defying aliens doesn't go to plan, C.M. Kozman's work also involved another work of speculative fiction in the form of Sniad. Sniad is a website dedicated to the exploration of a fictitious alien world and its inhabitants, and how they evolved. In 2012, C.M. Kozman was part of a team of other speculation-interested people that published another book. This time, it was about extinct life. All Yesterday's Unique and Speculative Views of Dinosaurs and Other Prehistoric Animals was written and illustrated by John Conway, Darren Nash, Scott Hartman, as well as Kozman. It tackles the question of how to best fill in the gaps in our knowledge of the biology and anatomy of extinct organisms when given the examples of living animals and their bizarre soft tissue body parts. You see, a skeleton preserved in the fossil record only gives you so much information on how that animal appeared in life. Living animals have amazing colors, flashy dewlaps, fatty humps, frills, spines, wattles, and so, so, so much more. The skull of a hippo, for example, is an eldritch horror to behold. Spines, crags, scoops, and those nasty tusks don't betray how soft, pudgy, and fat the real animal is. A hippo easily conceals its tusks behind huge deposits of muscles, skin, and sinew. The same could be said of extinct animals like the bizarre mammals of the Eocene, but could also be applied to the dinosaurs. Darren Nash writes in All Yesterdays, It is well known that the process of reconstructing a fossil animal involves a marriage of both hard data as well as a degree of informed speculation. That hard data involves such thing as lengths and widths of bones and other hard parts and the positions of specific muscle groups present in living animals, while the creation of a bone and muscles only reconstruction should be seen as the first step in the depiction of a fossil animal, and even as a presumably inescapable part of creating a reconstruction, readers may be surprised to learn that many people who have reconstructed extinct animals have frequently done so without recourse to these vital steps. Some of the greatest and most influential paleoartists of all time, like Zdenek Burian and Rudolf Zallinger, weren't so precise as to use the real measurements of the bones to create their masterpieces. They more or less gave it their best educated guess. A lot of their reconstructions don't really resemble the bones of the species concerned. Their work is nothing short of brilliant with their amazing techniques, but the anatomy eh, leaves a little bit to be desired. Paleo art involves science as much as it does art, and those reconstructions that didn't strive to keep some level of scientific credulity strained the line between science and art. So, to pay respect to all yesterdays and everything it set out to do, I should also point out that reconstructing a fossil animal isn't purely speculative guesswork, but involves a lot of rigorous evidence-led research where the artist produces a technically accurate musculoskeletal reconstruction. Everything starts getting hairy once you involve the stuff that stretches over top the skeleton and muscles, the integument. Skin, scales, feathers, hairs, and so on are all the stuff there isn't a ton of evidence for. 
All Yesterday sets out to look at the skeletons of extinct animals and fit in plausible pieces of soft tissue that makes reasonable sense to the animal's apparent physiology. The real problem with reconstructing dead things is the soft and squishy bits. I gave the example of the hippo before, but another good example as to how the outside anatomy of an animal can obscure the skeletal anatomy is found in owls. Look at their skeleton, then look at their bodies with muscles and skin applied, and then of course with all the other stuff on top of that. Each layer makes the skeleton disappear, and the animal look wildly different. Young owls without flight feathers look like aliens because more of their underlying anatomy is just poking through. Same could be said of just the bones we have of most dinosaurs. Without further ado, let's begin. I'm sure this image isn't unknown to you. This poor guy got slapped on an old Trey the Explainer video about the flesh-eating bull, Carnotaurus. This piece was made by John Conway and shows what's presumably a male individual strutting his stuff for the lovely lady flesh eaters. It has a pair of flaps on its hands used to help aid it in its sexual display. This isn't necessarily a new idea though. Carnotaurus and most members of its Abelisauridae family have some of the shortest arms of any theropod group. They are extremely unusual, even amongst short-armed theropods. Tyrannosaurs may also have short arms, but theirs still have full ranges of motion and can grasp with recurved talons. The abelosaurs, like Carnotaurus here, have ultra disproportionate arms. The radius and ulna were virtually immobile, while the humerus had such a rounded ball joint inserting it into the enormously inflated shoulder girdle that it could move in pretty much any direction. They could stick their arms out horizontally, which is highly unusual for most non bird line dinosaurs. C.M. Kozman also came up with this Majungasaurus piece to show a similar thing going on. The next speculation was by John Conway. Here we are met by the dark necks and bright white heads of a group of Elasmosauruses competing against each other to see who has the best moves. The authors have speculated that these elasmosaurs plunge down to great depths and then swim at high speeds to lunge out of the water to wave their necks in a pre-mating display. Many older depictions of plesiosaurs show them with swan or snake-like necks that flop around like noodles or strangle their prey. The real plesiosaurs had a much more rigid neck, though they retained some flexibility of course. These critters had rather dense bones and heavy necks that would have been too much to lift entirely out of the water. The stunt replicated in this piece thus shows the animals using up energy to push themselves vertically out of the water in a show of genuine prowess. Whoever is the fittest will have enough energy to push themselves out of the water the highest. Enurgnathids were some of the best and most unusual pterosaurs. They were the smallest, with some being as small as sparrows, with short, broad wings and wide, frog-like mouths. They had extremely small, bat-like tails, which they convergently evolved. The similarity in appearance between the Enurgnathids and bats has led many paleontologists to suggest these pterosaurs shared a similar lifestyle to the modern screaming memes. The piece used in this part of the book by John Conway shows a relatively common scene in today's jungles. A giant centipede has caught a poor hapless Enurgnathid and has begun to envenomate it. The fossil record of centipedes is kinda dooky, but some are known from Cretaceous aged rocks and look pretty much the same as they do today. It's extremely likely giant forms, like those that haunt the Amazon today, were around at the time of Enurgnathids. They would have provided our cute little skin flyers a formidable threat to look out for. I mean, giant centipedes routinely go after birds larger than most Enurgnathids today. So, you know. This piece by John Conway shows a scene relatively common in today's world, but pretty rare among the pages of artwork aiming to show how Earth was in the past. Here, a resting Allosaurus is unfazed by a curious Camptosaurus. Here's the thing, there's entirely too many pieces of paleoart that represent extinct life as vicious monsters that will attack anything on sight, no matter how full they are. That's not exactly realistic now, is it? 
Even the dumbest, most purely instinctual predators, like crocodilians and sharks, will tolerate other animals in their general proximity without killing them on sight. Sometimes they even do that when prey animals are around. This time he's cast a Tenontosaurus, just walking around. You see, you can't really get away from the unfortunate role the poor ornithopod Tenontosaurus has been cast in. Since one skeleton was discovered with the remains of some Deinonychus and some evidence of being fed upon by those predators, everyone has only ever reconstructed Tenontosaurus as the fodder for an overly aggressive pack of raptors. Not only were there other predators in the area at the time of our long-tailed herbivore, like Agrocanthosaurus, but there were many other herbivores that could have been prey items for a hungry Deinonychus. This piece serves to kill the cliché or stereotype. Contrary to popular belief, there really is no such thing as a pure herbivore or carnivore. Everything is on a spectrum, with some organisms getting pretty darn close to the extremes, like pandas and koalas in the case of herbivory, or big cats in the case of carnivory. Most animals fall somewhere on the spectrum. Most herbivores, like squirrels, cows, and horses, will readily chow down on baby birds for an extra helping of minerals and proteins. Prehistoric art is just as guilty of casting roles for animals that don't match reality. Predators are always on the prowl for their next victim. Giants are always seen in majestic repose, and small herbivores are meek and innocent. Here we have John Conway's take on the ultimate small herbivorous dinosaur, Hypsilophodon, tearing the heck out of a poor millipede to get some delicious bug meat. Dinosaur reproduction and sexual display is not often expressed in paleoart. I cannot help but think it is directly related to how prude so many cultures, especially Americans, are. I literally made a video about dinosaur reproduction as an educational video that's never been done before and it got flagged as possibly inappropriate just because of the thumbnail showing dinosaurs mating. Should I add that their bits aren't even visible? I feel like I should add that. I'm not bitter, you're bitter. I hate this place. Dinosaur reproduction is super important to the understanding of these animals, and we just need to get over our immaturity surrounding the subject. In the next All Yesterday's entry, John Conway has reproduced an image of a duck who died with an erection. This time, it's an oviraptorosaur called Sidipati. This is not entirely out there. Ducks have corkscrew-shaped members, and yes, I will censor some words to keep me in good standing with this platform. And females have labyrinthine cloacas to accommodate them. So who's to say some avian dinosaurs didn't convergently evolve a similar system? Make sure you leave a like and comment on this video. Share it around and subscribe. While you're at it, ring the notification bell too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Want to help Edge out? Subscribe to the Patreon at any tier you like for a whole smorgasbord of delicious offerings. Many thanks to Thea Svensson, Steve Bradshaw, Staniforth Hopkins, Natty Cat, Dinosaur, Arda Bayer, Abby Smith, Henry Brennan, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron. You've all helped to make this channel possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you.